as we think about poetry and what verse we will contribute to God in this beautiful play of life, we come to these words in James 4th chapter 13 through 17 verse. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Susie. On a New Year's Day football game, many years ago, 86 years ago, in fact, 1929, Georgia Tech was playing California. Late in the second quarter, Roy Regals recovered a fumble for California, and in this excitement, became, became confused and ran in the wrong direction. And a teammate had to race some 65 yards and tackle him before he got to the wrong end zone. They were on the two-yard line. California couldn't move the ball, so they attempted a punt, and it was blocked, so it's called a safety for Georgia Tech. And then it was halftime. And in the locker room, Roy Regals sat in the corner with his face buried in his hands, weeping. The whole room was silent, and the coach really didn't say anything during his usual halftime speech. But shortly before the team was to take field, the field for the second half, he said, the starting team is going back onto the field to begin the second half. So the whole team gets up and leaves the locker room except for Roy, who keep, continues to sit with his face buried in his hands. He says, I can't do it, coach. I can't play. I've ruined the team. And the coach said, get up, Regals. The game is only half over. You belong on the field. No matter how we play this game of life, uh, poorly or, or rather well, there's still more time to play. There still be, may be another half or another quarter there's still some more time to play, and we need to be on the field of life. That's why Paul in Ephesians 5, 16 says, Be very careful, then, how you live, making the most of every opportunity. Tomorrow isn't promised to any of us, is it? So that's why James, who's such a direct writer, says... In this reading from the fourth chapter, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. Then it vanishes away. And in our call to worship that you just enter into from Luke 9, here's how it reads in Eugene Peterson's The Message. On the road, someone asked Jesus if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. Jesus answered, follow me. Another man said, certainly, I'll follow you, Jesus. But first, excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus says, your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. Another person said, I'm ready to follow you, Master, but first excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. Jesus said, no procrastination. No backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. 
Let's pray. Lord, how precious is your love for us. How precious are these days that are made just for us. How precious is this worship time together. As James also says, let us not just be hearers of the word, but let us be doers. Let us bring your life to light. May it be so in our lives. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've been having a lot of fun with this movie series. And we've been looking at current movies except for this one. The team that's been working with us, I said, if you want to go back a few years and grab a movie, go ahead. So uh, a teenage girl said, let's do Dead Poet Society. I'm surprised she even knew Dead Poet Society. It was nominated for Best Picture and Robin Williams for Best Actor in 1989. But it had some tough competition. It grossed more at the box, box office than any other movie that year except for Driving Miss Daisy. Remember that one? And that's the one that got Best Picture. There was also the movie Born on the Fourth of July, Field of Dreams. Remember that one? And My Left Foot. In this one, a fellow named John Keating is going to come on the scenes in 1959 to a rigid New England prep school called Welton Academy for Boys that he had attended when he was that age. He was going to show some unconventional ways to appreciate literature and especially uh, poetry. And of course, they couldn't have got a character any better than Robin Williams to do that. In this early first scene that I want to show you, the poet Robert Herrick, who published this poem in 1648, the poem is called, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time. Listen how Robin Williams uh, uses that piece of poetry. Hmm. So as they look at those students from the past, and as we look at those who have gone before us, and it's fun to look at pictures from yesteryear, isn't it? And the message is that they're not a whole lot different than we are. And if we lean into them, now that they've gone on to their heavenly home, they might be saying something like, carpe diem, seize the day. John Keating, the teacher that Robin Williams plays, goes on to say, we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. Medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. To quote from Whitman, O me, O life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless strains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, what good amid these, O me, O life? Answer, Keating says, that you are here, that life exists, an identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse, that the powerful play may go on and you can contribute a verse. What will your verse be, boys? We can ask the same thing. Because we're asked that at every age. What will our verse be today? And tomorrow. Jesus tells a parable that is familiar to many of you, comes from the 12th chapter of Luke. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. 
And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Again, we hear Paul saying, be very careful then how you live, making the most of every opportunity. So they had this dead poet's society. And they had gone back and found a yearbook with Mr. Keating's picture in it and the name Dead Poet Society. And they said, what is it, Mr. Keating? And he said, a small group of us would meet at a cave near a pond less than a mile away, and there we would take turns reading Shelley, Thoreau, Whitman, our own verse, any number of poets. And in the enchantment of the moment, let them work their magic on us. And those boys found that cave. And that's how a lot of the story plays out. Keating was always trying to teach them how to look at things differently from a different perspective. So I want you to watch this next movie clip. It's one that Robin Williams breaks out into character, as he often does. So you'll like his character of Marlon Brando and John Wayne. So in this strict prep school based on tradition, the boys were stimulated to try to find their own voice. So you'll, you would see as you watch the play how that works as it plays out in some of the boys' lives. Robin Williams will quote Robert Frost who said, two, ver uh, two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the one last traveled by. You know that, and that made all the difference. How do you seize the day, the moment? How do we find our own voice? Not just those guys. How do we write our own verse? How do we announce God's kingdom? How do we build up treasures in heaven so that we leave a legacy on earth? One of the boys' name was Neil Perry. And Neil was put in this school by a very strict, um, rather ruthless father who would hear nothing except single-tracked mindedness on becoming a doctor. And as Neil would hear Keating saying, seize the day, he realized that his real passion in life was acting. So he quietly goes out for the Shakespearean play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And he gets the, he makes the play. In fact, he gets the leading role in the play. He has to get permission from his father to be a part of it, so he types out a letter from his father and signs his father's name to it. So you can see the conflict that's going to occur. His father learns about it and becomes very upset. Tells him to quit the play right before it, the production. And Neil refuses, but invites his dad to come. He says, Dad, I've been still getting straight A's in all of my medical courses, prep courses. So we're going to see now the, a lat, the final clip that I want to show you of the end of Midsummer Night's Dream and the adulation that Neil Perry is going to get. Watch when he comes 
on the stage by himself. His father's at the back of the auditorium and calls for him as soon as the play is over. So he walks out on the stage and he's expect he's got the smile on his face as he's finally accepting expecting approval from his father. But it doesn't come. Let's watch it. As it plays out, they go home. The father says that instead of being proud of what his son has accomplished, that he's pulling him out of this uh, prep school and he's going to put him into a military school so he'll even be more focused on medicine. And that night, the boy goes into his father's locked uh, drawer and pulls out his dad's gun and commits suicide. And instead of his dad reflecting on the way he had handled his son, he sat out on a mission to destroy Mr. Keating. And he got uh, dismissed from the school. The boys were forced to turn against him. And then in the final scene, as he comes into his old classroom, where the headmaster is now taking his class to get his personal belongings, uh, one boy after another stands up on their desk and in tribute to him. And he just simply says, thank you, boys. There are challenges in seizing the day. Um, but they're, they, if that day is wrapped in our knowledge of the love of Jesus Christ, uh, it's promised always to be a good one. This final clip is not from the movie, but it, it's very fitting uh, to follow the movie because I want to show you a uh, testimony of faith that comes from Dick and Artist Thomas. Uh, Dick and I have been talking about the, the needs of the church and the life of the church and his spiritual journey the last few years has been uh, an amazing one. He now sits, he's kind of started the front porch of the church. He sits out front, as a lot of you know, during the week, during the day, and he greets uh, people as they come into the church. You ought to see what happens when the uh, Sangyo Kim comes in with his three little girls uh, each morning. The oldest one is Ye Yin, who's going to be four on May 26, and the first thing she says to Dick is, she walks in, good morning, Mr. Thomas. Good morning, Dick. It's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, Dick, after a beautiful career in the, uh, in the Navy, he was an officer, spent four years in active duty and 36 years in reserve duty, worked in the uh, ag economics field as a professor at OSU and as a with the Ohio Police Chiefs Association his dear wife uh, Artis was a Sunday or was a both a Sunday school but a public school and a private school teacher uh, she taught even here in our own uh, preschool Christian preschool Dick has decided that he wants to seize the day and to live into the glory of what can happen by sharing his gifts, their gifts. So he's going, they are, they've cashed in two annuities and will be gifting uh, Bethel International United Methodist Church more than a quarter of a million dollars. I want you to listen to his testimony. Well, Arson, I appreciate the uh opportunity to uh, share a few thoughts and uh, you know she and I have been married almost uh, 58 years 
and uh, we've had a super relationship in the process. We've raised uh, four, four adult children and nine grandchildren, some of whom think they're adults. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> through this whole process, the church, God, Jesus, all have been a part of our, a strong part of our lives. The Lord didn't come and knock on our door, but I, I believe that it happens uh, with little nudges through life. And I can think of any number of times when certain things have happened to us that you just wouldn't expect to happen and uh, attribute that to, to the Lord giving us guidance. And I think in this, uh, uh, he plays a role in everything we do. It's a testimony of our faith. Uh, uh, and, you know, we've indicated uh, uh, what we do and what's happened to us all throughout the years as a result of how uh, God has looked at us with favor. As our lives have, have been uh, influenced greatly by our Christian belief, and this, uh, so this just naturally flows that uh, what has been given is given back. And now we've come to a stage in our lives where uh, we feel that we can share uh, some of the blessings that have been provided to us. And so we are, as Pastor Mike has said, uh, giving some money to the to the church and we look at it as a blessing in terms of this is really god's money that we've been using and now is a time for us to uh, give some of that money back uh, what we would hope would happen with this money is is that uh, this the church needs more money needs more financing and we hope that this will help in that and we'd also like to hope that uh, the, our what we've done may encourage others may encourage you to take a look at your situation and see if if you can help uh, to meet some of these needs that are are growing by the day Dick looked at all the implications that come about by giving a sizable gift of money like this, but he realized that his children and grandchildren are taken care of, that he and artists are taken care of, and there comes a time where enough is enough. Uh, he understands the implications, the tax implications, of giving a gift, an annuity before you die. But he and artists would love to see the fruits of that gift and to see how it plays out in the life of the church. So he wants to see the implications of seizing the day, of living into the moment for the glory of God. Uh, as, his, as their pastor, I'm obviously very uh, proud of them and I'm proud of what this can mean for the life of our church in the days ahead uh, two years from now we'll be celebrating our 175th anniversary as a church so we're starting to make plans for that and next week I'll tell you about some of the plans that will that will start as a uh, stimulus from Artisan Dick's gift and ways that you can be play a part and have a piece of the puzzle. Uh, you can find your verse in the dramatic play with God. Uh, Dick uh, and Artis, thank you very much. <laughs>